1939 was the last year of independence for Estonia. In his Independence Day speech, President Konstantin Petz expressed the hope that Estonia's independence would remain secure. Our country has experienced another peaceful year. Even though the whole world has been agitated, even while nations around us fear the prospect of a major bloodletting, our small Estonian nation has not been disturbed and has tended to its daily work in peace, fearless in our immunity. We want to live in peace, to work in peace. We want to avoid trouble and we want to contribute to the triumph of peace in the world. The summer of 1939 was beautiful, promising a good harvest. People worked in the fields, but these weren't ordinary times. The smell of war was in the air. People were alarmed. Austria had disappeared from the map and that spring, Czechoslovakia too. Germany had seized the Klaipeda region, which meant that nervousness was palpable in our area too. Estonia had no power to back its independence and the collective security system of our states was powerless as well. In the spring of 1939 the Soviet Union and Germany began to converge. At Molotov's initiative an additional protocol, a secret one, was appended to the non-aggression pact that they had concluded. Molotov, who was the chairman of the Council of People's Commissars and also the People's Commissar for Foreign Affairs of the Soviet Union, arrived in Berlin at the invitation of the Third Reich. The agreements provided for the division of Eastern Europe. They relegated Finland, Estonia and Latvia to the sphere of influence of the Soviet Union to be followed later on by Lithuania. The additional protocol was stamped top secret but news of it leaked out almost at once. The Estonian government knew of it within three days. All thinking people understood the danger of the German-Russian agreement but the fathers of the nation reassured the people and didn't inform them of the specifics of the pact. Aga ma sellest kuulsin juba, juba tähendab 39. aastal. Nimelt 39. aastal läksid I didn't know that this was the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact as such, but I had already heard of it in 1939. In 1939, the Baltic Germans began to depart for Germany, and my high school German teacher Karl Hoffmann was saying that he'd be leaving for Germany soon. Our great Führer is calling us back to Germany. As agreed between the governments of Estonia and Germany, Germans living in Estonia would be able to return to Germany. Germans with foreign passports at the resettlement station at Dombuyeste 3. The resettlement included both German nationals living in Estonia and Germans with Estonian citizenship. He said he would have gladly stayed but added that he survived one episode of Bolshevik terror and didn't want to experience that again. The exodus of the Germans was an ominous sign. Of the 16,000 Germans resident in Estonia, almost 13,000 left the country during a five-month period. Estonia emphasized its neutrality in the war that had broken out by now, but Molotov accused Estonia of violating neutrality and demanded that Estonia allow Soviet military bases to be established on her territory. Naval vessels with Soviet troops put out to sea, heading towards Estonia. The government gave in. On September 28th, a treaty permitting the presence of Soviet bases was signed. In accordance with a pact of mutual assistance, the Estonian Republic gave the Soviet Union the right to set up naval bases and some airports on the Estonian islands of Saarema and Hiyuma and in the town of Paldiski on the basis of a lease. 
Juba 3 nädalat varem paaside lepingu läbirääkimiste ajal oli NSV liit rikkunud Eesti Three weeks jõu. earlier even as negotiations were underway concerning the treaty that would allow the creation of Soviet bases the USSR had violated the integrity of Estonian waters and airspace Now everyone realized that Estonian sovereignty had come to an end 18. On October the 18th, the Red Army crossed the Estonian border. As early as September, the Soviet Union had threateningly assembled 600 tanks against Estonia's 30, 600 airplanes against Estonia's 60, and 160,000 troops at a time when the Estonian army consisted of 16,000 soldiers. Estonia would have been capable of mobilizing a total of 100,000 men if all able-bodied men had been called to arms. The Red Army troops were moving in excellent order. They would bring peace, a state of stability to the people of Estonia, and the friendship of the peoples of the Soviet Union. The treaty permitting the establishment of Soviet bases allowed the USSR to bring in 25,000 Red Army soldiers and airmen. The Red Fleet would be permitted to use the capital city as a temporary naval base. Marching hard as iron, the mighty army is coming. Flying the blood-red flag, the marshal leads us onward for homeland, for the party, for Stalin. When the Russian army started to move in from Kuivas to Harbor, they didn't want the people to see it. As a result, a great number of Home Guard personnel were summoned to duty in Sarema. On the way from Kuivas to Kuresare, there was a member of the Home Guard posted every 100 or 200 meters, wearing an armband and a gun on his shoulder. They didn't let the people onto the road. Even so, the village boys gathered in groups. Through the lilacs, we peered to see what they looked like. There was an interesting moment when an old Soviet gas truck stopped. It had a small artillery piece behind it. Six men were aboard right in front of us on the road. They were gravel roads back then, dusty ones. Then they jumped off this lorry, and one of them took an accordion. He had one knee on the ground and the other one up. He started to play the accordion, so these five soldiers danced there. And after they had amused themselves, they drove on. When the Russian army came, I was watching in the yard. They struck me as being comical. They had those funny hats on. And they stared at us. They kept marching on. There were quite a few of them. There is both a record player and books supplied for the so-called Red Corners. It was the old gray uniform, obviously dirty and unwashed. Even though the filthiness was awful, discipline was so strict that I don't know of any incidents related to the Russian military that was in Viljandi at that time. The Russians purchased bicycles in Estonia. The officers received their pay in Estonian crowns. They didn't know how to ride a bicycle, and they went to the place where the military unit was stationed. It used to be a fairground. Well, one of them would hold the saddle, and the other was on the bike, and that was how they learned to ride, such great officers and majors. <laughs>
On June the 5th, the German invasion of France began. Moscow took advantage of the fact that the eyes of the world were on France and acted without shame in the Baltic countries. Lithuania was presented with an ultimatum with Estonia following on June the 16th, demanding that the Red Army be allowed to take possession of the entire territory in the countries. The government acquiesced, then they demanded a new government I'll never forget what President Pat said. It was a very short speech. And we were all listening to the radio in our flats, standing up. We were crying as we listened. And he was so very right when he said that the Estonian Republic, that is to say, one million people, could not resist a country that numbered 180 million at that time and that we had to suffer. We had to suffer. Then came June the 21st, 1940. We were at the bank before the end of office hours. One of the clerks looked out of the window to see who was coming. We all gathered at the window to see, and there they came, a red flag in front and a group of 40 to 50 people. We didn't understand what was going on. There were about 30 to 40 women who worked at a flax mill and about 10 local communists. Some of the women were crying, so they didn't seem enthusiastic about the coup d'etat. Soon a telegram arrived saying that there had been an uprising in Tallinn and that a new government was being formed. The occupation forces formed a leftist puppet government headed by Vares. The communists were only allowed to organize demonstrations on the 21st of July in 12 settlements in Tallinn, Tartu and Vendra. President Petz remained at his post until the 22nd of July. He confirmed the arrangements and regulations of the occupying power. He signed all the papers submitted to him. The occupation forces rigged elections of the Estonian, Latvian and Lithuanian parliaments on the 14th and 15th of July. A single communist candidate was allowed to run in each constituency. They claimed fraudulently in Estonia that they received 92.8% of the votes cast. I was forced to become a member of the electoral committee. All the teachers had to do so. People came to vote because they were afraid, for by then people were already being arrested. We were told to bear in mind that anyone who wasn't for them was against them. Some of them did try to help people. They urged us to keep our mouth shut. Nowhere in the electoral propaganda had anyone mentioned changes of policy or that independence should be brought to an end. Quickly, on July the 17th, a demonstration took place, including a slogan, we demand that Estonia join the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. The newly constituted lower house of the Estonian parliament was convened from July 21st to the 23rd, replete with red flags, posters, portraits of Marx, Engels, Lenin and Stalin, the loud yelling of slogans and tumultuous ovations. Decisions were taken in favor of proclaiming Soviet power, of requesting that Estonia be incorporated into the Soviet Union, to nationalize land, the banks and large industry, despite the fact that Estonia had no large industry. 
A delegation of the lower house of the Estonian parliament traveled to Moscow to request acceptance into the Union. One of the slogans on the train said, Liberated Estonia greets the invincible Soviet Union. On August 6th, the Supreme Soviet of the USSR assigned Estonia the status of a Union Republic. It was Johannes Laudistin, secretary of the Central Committee of the Estonian Communist Party, who spoke at the session of the Supreme Soviet and proposed that this be done. The Red Year began, but Soviet power was never really completely established. Instead of Soviets, only executive committees were set up. Veteran Estonian communists were used as cadres, along with so-called July communists, Estonians who had been living in Russia as fellow travelers. Even before the formal incorporation, Estonia's clocks were reset to Moscow time. The party declared that the national economy must be reorganized according to socialist principles, that the machinery of state must be strengthened, and workers retrained in accordance with communist ideas. The new regime began to take over enterprises. The Estonian crown was pegged to the ruble at a low rate. Prices and wages rose, but real wages sank significantly. Harsher working conditions were imposed, similar to those of large socialist countries. Secretaries of the Central Committee of the Estonian Communist Party, Neme Ruz and Johannes Lauristin, and First Secretary Karl Sare, three smiling comrades. As a member of the big family of the peoples of the Soviet Union, Estonian youth can freely celebrate its day of youth under the protection of the glorious Red Army. In the curriculum of Soviet schools, Russian is the first language. Hello children, take your seats. We'll continue the lesson. Elmo, come here. Tell us what time it is now. It's seven o'clock. It's seven o'clock. Now you ask. Irmela, what time is it? It's two o'clock. It's two o'clock. It's two o'clock. Throughout Soviet Socialist Estonia, implementation of land reform is in progress. New boundaries appear in the fields, delineating new farmsteads. Without exception, the people are inspired by this Bolshevist land reform, which abolishes speculation in land and allows true farmers to work in their own fields. <laughs> Fifty thousand homesteaders obtained land, practically everyone who so desired. People were insistently urged to apply for land. Among them were elderly people, craftsmen of eighty years and older, who never really intended to become farmers. Homesteads of ten and eleven hectares were established with one cow and a horse. These households were never intended to reach prosperity. The size of a farm was limited to a maximum of 300 hectares. Yoyar was the Minister of Agriculture and he wrote in a newspaper. People are talking about establishing collective farms, but I assure you that there will be nothing of the kind. No one will be deprived of his own property. You can all feel safe at your work. There will be no such thing. Suddenly the people found themselves in a schizophrenic society. The gap between ominous reality and shameless lying propaganda was tremendous. People had to march in processions carrying the portraits of the new leaders. The totalitarian state was forging plowshares into swords. 
I remember a meeting of bank officials in the month of April, and the vice president of the bank was present. He had come from Moscow. Zhabrev was his name. So Comrade Zhabrev gave a speech about the international situation, and he ended it with the words, War between the Soviet Union and the capitalist countries is inevitable and necessary in April 1941. And this struck us, this man daring to say in public that it was inevitable and even necessary. Long before that, everyone had bought salt, sugar, matches and petroleum. They were big petroleum bottles, 50 liters in size. We even had one that held 100 liters. I don't know what they were for in the old times. Everything was being hoarded. It was a regime that lied. No one told the truth, absolutely never. They never told him that they had come to arrest him. Oh, no. They came to offer him a job at the university, and they begged him to come. Terror was a pervasive component of Soviet life. Right after the coup d'etat in June, they began to arrest people. 2,000 people were killed on Estonian territory during the Red Year. On June 14, 1941, 10,000 people were deported. 4,000 of them were children. Early in the morning of June the 14th, they came for us. We had already reckoned with the likelihood that father would be taken away. I remember that I was the last one still asleep when mother came. She woke me up. She said, wake up, Lea. They have come for father. I was startled and started to cry. But I got up and there was a militia man sitting right there in the room who said it was probably going to be all right. There we stood or sat. Suddenly one of the Russians said, what are you thinking? Start packing. They didn't even tell us in the beginning that they had come for us. A lorry was parked before the door and we were put on the lorry and the drive began. It was an open truck. We saw other such vehicles. There was a man, an acquaintance, just in his light overcoat, standing in a lorry, his head held upright. There was a big convoy ahead. On the whole, the mood was totally peaceful, dignified. They stayed put for three days. They were assembled during Friday night and didn't leave until Monday. This leave-taking was awful, how they cried and sang through the windows. The Chancellery of State, the early hours on that historical June the 22nd. The offices of the Broadcasting Corporation. Preparations are underway for the transmission of the Führer's proclamation by all German radio stations. Minister of State Dr. Goebbels reads out the Führer's proclamation. For the first time in front of the entire world, this reveals the plot between London and Moscow against Germany. Now at the twelfth hour, the Führer is drawing the only possible conclusion, saying, I've decided to put the fate and future of the German country into the hands of our soldiers again. The German army now protects Europe from the northern Cape to the Black Sea, on land, at sea, and in air, side by side with the Finns and the Romanians. Italy will join us spontaneously, Slovakia as well.
Only a year before, everyone had been afraid of war. Now the Estonian people waited for the German-Russian war as their only way out. The horrors of the Red Year had largely changed attitudes towards the Germans. No one had an inkling the German army would take Tallinn in just two months and a week. The chance someone might predict that the Red Army would reconquer Tallinn three years and three months from now was even more remote.